I have a lot of memories of uh, Koshalin, my childhood in Koshalin. We, uh, my family were not rich, but they were quite comfortably well off. And we led a fairly typical sort of German bourgeois life. My, my parents were religious Jews, though not orthodox. Uh, but they felt very much German at the same time. And the fact that they felt so assimilated to Germany was probably their downfall because they thought that Hitler would not last very long. But I have very good memories of uh, a happy home life with a lot of music. My father played piano and so did my, my, my mother. And, um, my father and I sang, I sang with my father accompanying me at the piano. And um, I also particularly remember the summer holidays we spent in Mielno, which was at that time a little fishing village. We went there on Sunday and the little fishing village has uh, changed into a large, thriving, very busy uh, seaside resort. Uh, but. It, so that has changed a great deal, but the, the water was still as cold as it used to be. So I had a very happy childhood until 1933, when things began to change steadily. And uh, for the Jews in Koshalen, life became very difficult. But for example, by 1936, um, this shrinking community of Jews, because many were left to go abroad, <coughs> Uh, was no longer able to have its uh, services in the large synagogue uh, because bricks and stones were thrown through the windows during the service. So that Friday evening and Saturday morning services had to take place in the home of one of the people in Koshalin. But then later, by 19, the end of 1936, I was no longer able to go to the school in Koshalin because I was being attacked by boys who threw stones at me. And my form teacher was an, a Nazi who appeared in, uh, in, in uniform, in brown shirt uniform, and made life very unpleasant for me. And that is the time when my parents decided to send me to Berlin to be in the safekeeping of a Jewish boys' orphanage there. And that was a very fortunate choice because the director of the orphanage selected me to go to England in one of the first, in the first kinder transport which left Berlin for England. Well, my parents had a flat in the street leading to the railway station. It was then called Neue Bahnhofstraße, a third floor flat. Not very spacious because we had to move into a smaller flat when things became very hard economically for my father. And he earned less and less money. We had to move into a smaller flat and we sold our grand piano and much of our furniture and so on. And in this, this flat had a small balcony off the kitchen at the back. Yes, I did sit there quite often dreaming and fantasizing and I pretend, I thought to myself I'm sitting in a boat or in a ship sailing over the seas. I didn't know where I was sailing to but uh, yes, that was one of my fantasies at the time. Is that 
I did sail across the Channel anyway, or across the North Sea, from uh, Hamburg to Harwich in England. And in a way, in a way, everyone is a sailor, I suppose, because we all go to destinations which we know very little about, and I certainly knew nothing about going to England. And. Um, Yes, I mean, life was cruel in Germany at that time for Jews, very, very cruel. Uh, but my early childhood in Koshalin was a very happy one. Uh, I have very happy memories of my life here and my life in Mielno by the, by the sea. And um, it became very difficult in 1936. And then when it became very cruel for Jews generally in Germany, yes. My first visit to Koshalin was 12 years ago in 1989 and um, I'm really quite astonished about the transformation which has occurred in Koshalin and in Poland generally I think probably. At that time Koshalin was still very poor, there were hardly any restaurants, I felt very much a stranger here and um, I went to the town hall but uh, uh, talking to people in the town hall they were very polite but it was quite difficult for me to um, obtain information which I wanted to get uh, and this time it's very very different and it's different for two reasons. One is that economically uh, the situation in Koshalin has changed enormously. It's become a much bigger city, much more thriving, prosperous city than it was. But the main other difference is that I now have friends here in the form of uh, Zidislav Pacholsky and his family, um, which has made all the difference to me because the first time I came, it was very cathartic, it was very traumatic for me to come back to the town in which I was born. Uh, and which um, reminded me of my early family life and the fact that my, most of my family have died in concentration camps. And so it was very sad for me to be here. But this time it's quite different and I feel very much more positively about it. And um, I'm very grateful to Zivislav Pacholsky for having helped me to achieve this.
Well, first of all, I lost my, what the Germans call my Heimat, um, the place where I was born, where I was brought up, where my family lived, all my family, my relations were in Koshalin, or Kurslin, as, as it was called then. And that has lost, been lost forever. Um, and of course, I've also lost my family, most of my family. My sister, my parents, my uncles, my aunts, my cousins, most of them died in the Holocaust. But of course, I've also gained a great deal from going to England, by going to England. I, um, I probably, if I had remained in Germany, I probably would not have been able to go to university. I've never had anyone in my family who went to university. Uh, they were all, my whole family were made a living from being business people, shopkeepers or something of that kind. Um, and I don't know that I would have had the opportunity or the possibility or the initiative to go to university in Germany. I might have done, who knows. But certainly going to England and going to a, a very good school there, a Jewish, German Jewish school, which the headmistress had um, moved to England in 1933, when she realized what was about to happen. Mm -hmm. She moved the whole school to England, and I was very fortunate to be taken in there when I arrived, shortly after I arrived in England. And it gave me a good education, I then went into the army, the British army, as soon as I could, because I wanted to help liberate my family. And because I went into the army, I was able to go to university afterwards at the expense of, this, of the British government as an ex-serviceman after the war. And uh, so I became a scientist and I've had a fantastic career as a scientist, which I'm very grateful for. And that is something which I almost certainly would not have had had I remained in Germany. So in that sense, my life has been very much enriched. But of course, I have always suffered from a sense of, of guilt. What, you know, something which is known as survivor's guilt. The guilt I feel for having survived, whereas my sister, my parents, my uncles and aunts and so on, did not survive. And that has been quite hard to bear. And it's been with me all the time. We had a fine voice, young, youngish man. And at all the high holidays, he all sang prayers. Mm -hmm. And there's one particular prayer I remember, I think it must have been uh, sung at um, Yom Kippur. I think it's a Kol Nidre. That's, I remember that so clearly from those days. Wonderful. I've never forgotten that. And how it was possible that uh, uh, the organ music were uh, introduced in, in the culture of uh, Jewish liturgy, Jew, Jewish... Yes, but uh, well, it was a liberal synagogue. Mm -hmm. So they had this very large and impressive organ which my father enjoyed playing very much and uh, when he played the fortissimo you know you could hear it uh, uh, you would hear it go around the uh, the dome uh, it was very, a very fine organ but it had to be pumped by hand with the pumps and the com Jewish community uh, employed a little man who was really quite weak to do the pumping I think he must have been non-Jewish because and we wouldn't have asked the Jew to do it. Shabbos Gavu. Yeah. And every now and again, on a day of prayer, Yom Kippur or whatever, the, the, the organ went very flat. Oh. <laughs> and I used to sit with my mother in the choir, facing the altar, 
and the Ark. And I had to uh, rush to the organ and take over the pumping floor. Yeah. <laughs> it was very important for me. Well, um, there have been these great upheavals in the 20th century and um, starting with the massacre of the Armenians by the Turks and uh, it's been going on ever since and of course the Holocaust and the destruction of uh, so many millions of Jewish people all over Europe by, by the Germans uh, is one horrific example of this, but there have been others in Africa and um, in Serbia recently, ethnic cleansing, for example. And I have the feeling that man mankind hasn't learned anything from past experience, that we don't seem to learn from our his history. Uh, I used to think that what happened in Germany could only have happened in Germany and nowhere else. But I no longer think that. Uh, I feel that human nature being what it is, if the economic and social political situation is of a particular kind which favors that kind of brutality, it could happen anywhere. And it's something which I don't like to admit. I don't like to admit it could happen in England, for example. But. I'm no longer sure about that. And I fear that um, we just do not learn from past experiences. Otherwise, what happened in, in Serbia would never have happened. <laughs>